Hello everyone and welcome to week four of Geology 100 Lab and today's topic this week is earthquakes, which is chapter 11 in your laboratory manual. Now instead of our normal laboratory exercises through Canvas, I've given you all a brief earthquake handout. Everything I'm going to discuss in this video is applicable to the earthquake handout. Now within that handout, I give you a beginning intro to what will be talked about in that handout, specifically seismic waves and how we can use those to interpret the locations of earthquakes. And then how we can use that data to exactly determine the intensity and the magnitude of earthquakes. Now we briefly talked about earthquakes um, if you were in my uh, Geology 100 lecture um, when we're trying to interpret Earth's internal structure. And we've also talked about earthquakes within um, Geology 100 lab during our second week's topic, which is plate tectonics. Through further understanding and better understanding earthquakes, it's essentially a, been able to help us develop tools that have revealed um, Earth's internal structure and in a more detailed sense. We know that earthquakes release a ton of energy and the energy is released in the form of seismic waves. And through these seismic waves, we've been able to use them um, to map out Earth's internal structure. Now, specifically the changes in composition and behavior of the different layers which within Earth's interior. Through the use of seismic waves from earthquakes, we have gone from this preconceived notion um, that Earth is a homogeneous body, to it actually being heterogeneous with changing states of matter and different types of material as we move from the top of the Earth, the surface of the Earth, all the way through Earth's core. It's also helped us define boundaries between plates. So that is talking about plate tectonics, those coherent rock body slabs. It's helped us further understand the asthenosphere, which is the upper part of the mantle. Now remember, our Earth's surface can be broken into the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, where the lithosphere is Earth's crust in the uppermost part of the mantle, and the asthenosphere, or the asthenosphere, depending on how you say it, is the upper part of the mantle. Through earthquakes and seismic waves and seismology, it's also helped us track movements of these plates as they are being subducted. So if you are in my Geology 100 lecture, that is our topic for this week, which is plate tectonics. And subduction, thus being the type of plate boundary of convergence. So either how an oceanic crust is being subducted underneath the continental crust, or how a older and more dense oceanic crust is being subducted underneath a younger and a little bit less dense the oceanic crust. Earthquakes are essentially the shaking of the earth due to a rapid release of energy. Um, and most of, most of which this is due to plate tectonic forces, which is this very slow on the human time scale relatively speaking, the very slow movement of these tectonic plates through time. Now, this sudden release of energy is due to the sticking of some areas of these tectonic plates, most of which occurs along these plate boundaries. And when you have this sudden slippage, this sudden unsticking of these plates with respect to one another, it releases a tremendous amount of energy. So think about it as if you have a stick and you slowly bend that stick and you know that you can slowly bend a stick and maybe release it. It goes back to its original state. What happens if you continue to bend that stick and then it suddenly breaks? That sudden breakage will cause your arms to rattle and shake and you'll see the two ends where it's broken and split along that breakage of that stick. You'll see them maybe flare out to the sides. The energy that is released from that stick is um, wave energy. And within Earth's internal structure, we call that rapid release of energy seismic waves. We measure seismic waves through these machines called seismometers. And measuring the different types of seismic waves through seismometers helps us glean a couple other pieces of information. And that being able to describe the Earth 
earthquake location, so exactly where that earthquake occurred, but also the strength of that earthquake. We have two main types of seismic waves, and those are body waves and surface waves. Body waves are seismic waves that travel through the interior of the Earth. And surface waves are seismic waves that travel at just at or just below Earth's surface. We have two main types of body waves, and those are P waves, or primary waves, and S waves, which are secondary waves. And I'll talk about P waves first, primary waves. Now, P waves are the fastest, fastest seismic waves. P waves, these primary waves, can travel through a variety of different states of rock material inside Earth's interior. So they essentially can travel through solids, liquids, and gases. And we know that Earth's interior is not just one solid rock body. There are some areas in Earth's interior, specifically the mantle and the outer core, where we do see the solid rock in a fluid state or in a solid-ish state, where it's not necessarily a liquid and it's not necessarily a solid. Now, P waves, they're the fastest waves because they are compressional waves. So if you have a P wave that's traveling in one direction, as it is traveling, it is changing the volume of that material. So it is slowly shrinking that, that rock into a smaller volume and expanding it as it is moving. So P waves are very fast because they are moving backward and forward parallel to the direction of that the seismic wave is traveling. We call that the direction of movement of this seismic wave, we call that the propagation. So the direction in which that seismic wave is traveling in the first place. When we are recording seismic waves on a seismometer, because P waves are the fastest, they are the first to arrive at that seismometer. The second type of body wave that we have is the S wave or the secondary wave. And that is because S waves travel slower than P waves. Now, unlike P waves, S waves can only travel through solids. And I remember that by the S from S wave corresponding to solid. So S waves, secondary waves, are shear waves. So we talked about the direction of propagation of that wave. So S waves, these secondary waves or these shear waves, they move perpendicular to the direction of propagation of that seismic wave. So instead of compressing and changing the volume of that material, S waves change the location of that material. So they travel perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So as it is moving forward, it is also simultaneously moving up and down like a wave. Now S waves, like I said, they arrive second. So if an earthquake occurs, a seismometer is first going to record that P wave, and then it's going to record that S wave. Because S waves travel perpendicularly, because S waves travel perpendicularly to the direction of propagation, they cause extensive damage. Because as it is moving forward, it's also moving up and down. So we have body waves and then we have surface waves. Now surface waves are seismic waves that travel along Earth's surface or just below it. And we have two main types of surface waves and that are L waves, love waves, and Raleigh waves. Now surface waves are much slower than body waves and they tend to move in a rolling or a swaying motion. Now, love waves, they vibrate horizontally, just like a snake on Earth's surface. So in the diagram here, when we see an earthquake and we see the damage after an earthquake, and maybe you see a bridge that looks like it has gone all rolly curvy, like a meandering river, that is due to an L wave, this love wave that is coming through as a result of the energy uh, releasing from this earthquake. And then, then we have R waves, which R waves, they move in a circular pattern opposite of the wave motion. So as they're propagating forward, they're also curling their way back like um, a wave. And so 
um, this is how you can get these changes in Earth's surface that look like the ground has gone up and down. So as I stated earlier, S and P waves get their name, secondary waves and primary waves, due to the velocity, which is essentially how far they're traveling over a given amount of time. Now seismometers are kept at seismic stations. Now these seismic stations are, can be placed in a variety of locations. Now, once we have an earthquake that has occurred and is that rapid energy is released, a seismic station will begin to record the energy from that earthquake. And it records these on a seismograph. Now, P waves are the first to arrive. S waves are the second to arrive, and then the surface waves are the last ones to come on through. So on the screen here, we have an example of uh, seismometers at seismic stations on the left-hand side of this figure. And then we have the seismograms that are the data that's recorded by the seismograph itself here on the right-hand side. So here we have an earthquake, and here is the epicenter, which is the point on Earth's surface directly above the earthquake, where at station one, it has recorded the energy released from this earthquake. At station two, it has recorded the energy released from this earthquake. And at station three, it has recorded the energy released from this earthquake. Now, based on this figure, you can see that station one is situated the closest to the earthquake epicenter, and station three is situated furthest from the earthquake epicenter. So essentially that means is that station one should receive that P wave first, and then station three should receive that P wave last out of all the stations. But we know that P waves travel faster than S waves. So at station one, it's gonna record that P wave first, and then sometime after, it's gonna record that S waves. Now, why is it important? Why is it important that we understand S and P wave velocity? It's like I said earlier, where we can use the changes in these velocities, but also the recordings at these different seismic stations to help us determine, A, the location of the earthquake, and B, the actual magnitude of the earthquakes, so how much energy that earthquake released in the first place. So here's a very good example of a seismograph, which is produced from a seismogram from the seismometer, um, from the seismic station that recorded the seismic waves in the first place. So the, seism the seismometer essentially will start recording um, the first wave to arrive. Now when that first wave arrives, we call that time zero, and everything continues on from that time zero. As you can see here on the axes here, we have time, which starts at zero, and continues all the way to 110. Now time, for the most part, on these seismograms will either be recorded as seconds or minutes. So at time zero, we can see the seismogram has uh, started to record some kind of seismic activity. And then we see it peter off, and then we see it kick up again. Now think back to S and P waves. Which is the first seismic wave to arrive? The P wave. So that's essentially what we have recorded here on the seismograph, where the P wave essentially starts our time zero. So we have the recording of the P wave and then it peters out. So what do we have, do you think, here recorded at our next seismic wave or this recording here on this graph? That will be our S wave, so the secondary wave. So why do you think it's important for us to denote when the P wave first is, is recorded at this seismic station and thus when the S wave is recorded at this seismic station? We use the time difference between the first arrival of the P wave and the, and the first arrival of the S wave to help us determine how far away that this seismic station is from the earthquake epicenter. Because we know, essentially, the average velocity at which a P wave and an S wave travels. And so we know that P waves travel faster than S waves. So the, fa the farther that a P wave has to travel, 
it's going to incrementally get a little bit faster than that S wave because it has traveled more quickly. So at a seismic station that's farther away from the earthquake epicenter, that time for when that first P wave arrived to that time to when the first S wave arrived is going to be that time gap between the two is going to be much greater than if that seismic station were to be closer to that earthquake epicenter. And so we call that the P uh, and S wave time interval or the SP lag time. Now the SP time interval or the SP lag time will be unique for each seismic station and thus each earthquake that is recorded at this seismic station. So in your earthquake activity, the assignment that you have for this week, you will be calculating various SP time intervals for a variety of seismic stations to help you locate an earthquake epicenter. Now you could take this SP time interval and equate it onto an XY plot. Now some of these XY plots will look like these, where these XY plots are essentially time travel plots. Where these travel time curves, they show the relationship between the distance travel of a seismic wave, which is usually given in kilometers, and the relative seismic wave velocity, which is usually in minutes or seconds. Now on this travel time plot, you can see that there are different travel time lines. And so we have P waves, S waves, L waves, and R waves. And they have different equations. These different kinds of waves have different line equations because they travel at different velocities. So P waves will travel, will travel a much greater distance in a given amount of time than an S wave. And an S wave will travel a much greater distance in a given amount of time than an L wave. And the same thing with an R wave. So how is this actually done? On your assignment, you're gonna be given um, a bunch of different of these seismograms um, for a set amount of locations in order to help determine an earthquake epicenter. So for each one of these seismograms, you're gonna calculate the SP lag time. Now that's essentially gonna be the time here on this x-axis from when the first P wave arrives to the first S wave arrives. Now, when you look at these, look at these graphs, you're gonna look at this first tick, so at time zero, and then you're gonna calculate um, the next biggest tick. And essentially that is gonna be where your S wave starts. So for this case on this seismogram, we've calculated the SP lag time is 45 seconds. So how do we figure out the distance? that essentially how far that um, uh, S, these waves have traveled from the earthquake's epicenter. Now using that time travel plot, if we know the SP lag time, we can extrapolate out the distance using these line equations for the different SP time intervals. The first step of your assignment is to essentially create your own um, travel time plot for the SP intervals. So you'll have a chart for a given amount of distances um, starting from 100 kilometers all the way up to 900 kilometers. At each one of these distances, you're gonna calculate the SP time interval with this lower line being the P interval and this top line being the S interval. So the intervals are essentially gonna be the time difference between this P line and this S line. So for each one of these distances, you're gonna record the SP lag time for each one of those intervals. At the end, you will then plot that time for that distance on this graph. Now, when you plot all these points out on this graph, you should eventually get a straight line. Now, the straight line is what you use for the remainder of the earthquake activity. Once you've calculated the SP lag time for each one of these seismograms, you can then compare it with the SP time interval line that you've created um, at the beginning of this exercise. You can then record these on that chart for each one of these seismometers locations from the earthquake epicenter. Once you've calculated the distance for each one of these seismometer stations, 
you will then be able to plot all of these on your map. So on the map that you've given is the western portion of the United States. Now if you don't have a compass that is one of these tools here, you can also use a pencil attached to a string. Now the string, you need to compare that to the scale that's given in the assignment. Now that scale is going to be some amount of inches per several hundred kilometers. Now the data that you plotted for each SP time interval for each seismic station is essentially a radial distance from each seismic station, which is why you need three of these. You cannot calculate an earthquake epicenter using just data from one seismic station. Because essentially that's saying that that earthquake epicenter occurred in some distance away from that seismic station, which means that it could have occurred in any direction. So if you have three seismic stations, that means at least three sets of data from seismic stations, you can use the junction where those three circles that overlap in order to find out the actual earthquake epicenter. Now for this assignment, like I said, if you don't have a compass, you can use the string tied to your pencil. And what you're going to do is you're going to pinpoint that seismic station and use your compass or that string on your pencil in order to draw um, a circle around each seismic station. Now because of the size of the map for this assignment, you'll likely have to create some arc for each one of these seismic stations. Now remember that distance is just the radius. So that's going from the center of that circle, which would be the seismic station, to the edge of that circle or that arc. At the end of this assignment, you should be able to pinpoint the earthquake epicenter. And that will be where all three of these circles or these arcs intersect one another.